to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. Today, I am super excited to be joined by Ryan Mathy, a leadership and life performance coach who specializes in personal development and growth and who has worked with CEOs, directors, through to actors and artists. His profession was quite literally to help improve results for people both personally and professionally. Now considered to be one of the most highly trained and experienced experts in the industry, Ron is about to launch his first book. And the working title at the moment is Holy, I won't say the second word, begins with F and ends in K, Future, How to Create Any Results in Your Business and Your Life. Now you may be wondering why I'm speaking to a performance and leadership coach on a payroll podcast. It's a good question. The fact of the matter is payroll is challenging. Nearly every call a payroll professional receives will be a complaint about pay. Rarely will an employee call a payroll office and say, hey, I just wanted to say thanks for getting my pay right again this month. It just doesn't happen. Handing complaints in a pressurized environment that requires expert attention to detail, logical thinking, and nothing but consistent high performance is incredibly tough. You know that, right? You work in payroll. So the stress that payroll professionals are often under is overwhelming, but rarely recognized, especially at board level. Now, I see this stress firsthand sometimes when payroll managers come to me needing urgent recruitment support to ensure that the payroll they're responsible for is run effectively and accurately. It's a very common thing for payroll professionals to work well into the night and sometimes through weekends, simply because they are passionate and more importantly, committed to getting payrolls out on time. Having said that, the reputation of the payroll industry is thankfully improving and the status of the payroll professional is elevating. The majority of us want to progress our careers and now that payroll professionals are gaining recognition, partly to do with the chartered status and the CIPP that they gained in 2011, more and more strategic seats are becoming available for those that want them at the board level table. So with these considerations in mind, I personally think Ryan is perfectly positioned to be able to provide a number of thought-provoking calls to action and strategies that I think can help payroll professionals to handle stress more effectively while simultaneously providing practical methods that can help you progress your professional career and your personal ambitions both more organically and successfully. So with this in mind, let's crack on with the podcast. A huge welcome to the pod. Ryan Matthew. Hi, Nick. Hey, Ryan. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Great to be here. Good to have you. Good to have you on the pod. So, if you don't know the format, we always start with five quick questions. Five quick questions. I'm going to start with one that just, I guess, gives some context to why I've invited you onto the pod. Tell the listeners a little bit about your journey, as it is quite an interesting one. And if I'm correct, it started with a profound personal experience during a walk down a street in Brethnell Green. Yeah, so the, I was with my girlfriend at the time and we had been together It was quite a new relationship, but we started having this argument and every single weekend we had the same argument. And it was basically the argument where she was wrong and I was right. And (laughs) something was going on, but all I started to become aware of was there was a pattern. And anyway, every, every time we had this argument, she kept repeating, it's nothing to do with me. And I was like, no, it is you, it is you. And on this fourth weekend, walking down the street in London, she said, it's nothing to do with me. And in this moment, I asked myself in my head, like, what if it's got something to do with me? And it seems like such a obvious question to ask, but really, you know, so much of my life was about finding fault in others, blaming others and being really, really sure that I was just completely innocent. In this moment, I asked myself the question, what if it's got something to do with me? And honestly, my whole life flashed in front of me, relationships that I'd been in, relationships with family, friends, colleagues, you know, things at work, everything flashed in front of me where I just saw myself as being somebody in life who was more of a pinball in the machine rather than the person pushing the buttons. So I walked back to my my house in Bethlehem Green. I went into my bedroom, shut the door, and I literally cried like a baby. You know, it was like I was being exercised because really what was happening was I started to see that there was so much I was sure about in my life And in this moment, I saw I wasn't seeing the full picture. There was stuff that was going on that I wasn't seeing clearly until this moment. That's a big thing to admit, right? A growing man in his 30s, closing his bedroom door and and crying. Yeah. Emotionally, I've probably got quite a high EQ, which makes me, you know, naturally quite a good fit to be a coach. But, you know, for me, it's important to be real and to to just be yourself rather than try and be perfect or trying to to look good. I've, I've done that for years. But this is a turning point where I could just really own my own humanity. So I'd never had any problems 
talking about this or sharing it because I just feel that a lot of people go through stuff like this and the more I can share it, the more people can be free. Even to the point in this moment, I hadn't even spoke to my dad in 20 years. So all of this was flashing in front of me. And at some point in the tears, there was more like a smile through the tears because I realized that I was really starting to wake up and there was a freedom that was starting to be uh, experienced that was never there before. And then the next day I started having conversations. I, I was really compelled to act and take actions I'd never taken before. So I started calling my family. I started telling them things that I'd never told them before that I needed to talk to them about, things that we'd maybe pushed under the carpet. And I started to really express how I felt, telling them I loved them. And then I started getting contact with my ex-girlfriends and apologising for all the stuff I'd brought to the table that I'd essentially blamed them for. Uh, Emailing, Facebooking, texting, phoning, the whole thing. And really this journey of cleaning up my past had started that day. And it was very intense for about two years. It was profound. And, you know, I really experienced, you know, having integrity in my life, getting responsible for my life, where it was headed, and actually just being authentic to where I wanted to go in my life and um, yeah it was profound so essentially you started taking responsibility for your life yeah I guess if I put this into context of the podcast what are the steps you perhaps would recommend a stressed out pearl professional who who who's maybe fed up feels overworked they're underappreciated what would you recommend that they should take for them to find the the same kind of inner peace if you like that, that you found after your journey Really what happened for me that day was, you know, you know, in life it's very busy, isn't it? Sure. Like we go to work, we're on our mobile phones, we're distracted by TV, we've got relationships, responsibilities. It's noisy. It's very noisy. It's fast. And if you just look at it right now, there's not a lot of space. You know, people don't have a lot of space. And I don't just mean physical space. I mean the space here in your head, space inside. So in that moment, In Bethnal Green, I discovered space because I asked myself a question. I blocked everything else out and I gave myself room to inquire into an area that I'd never looked at before. And in space, what happens is you you start to get really connected to what is important to you. You start to see the truth, but it doesn't happen so often for most of us because we're just too busy. Sure. Everything's too fast. There is no space. Whether you've got family responsibilities or you work a lot or you're working on projects or you've got a full life, it's so easy to be distracted. And so I would say the first step is to slow down, just slow everything right down. And if what I'm talking to you about in this podcast is starting to resonate for you somehow, then there's something there that you might want to get in touch with about that. And your only access would be to slow down. Maybe you just got to ask yourself, like, what is the truth? What is the truth about your situation? What's the truth about what you're dealing with? You know, just really inquire to yourself, what is the truth? A really practical step that you could take is to write yourself an email. Okay. I write in a journal. It's part of my daily ritual. I get my notes app in my iPhone or my iPad or my my MacBook. And I start writing in my journal what's there for me, how I feel about things, what I'm thinking about things. And it's a process of just really working stuff out so I can get clarity. In that process, I'll, I'll see things that are maybe new or I'll get an insight into something, but essentially I'll end with an action point that I can put in into practice and, and just deal with something and have it be effective. So writing is a really great form of therapy, I believe, and self-coaching and, and getting insight. So write yourself a letter or start keeping a journal where you can get in touch with whatever it is that's going on for you. Another great step is to get a coach. Yeah. Well, presumably, in understanding the life of the pale professional, one of the biggest obstacles that they're going to come back to when you say, you know, we need to slow the life down or slow things down, find some headspace is, I don't have the time. I don't have the time to slow down. If I if I slow down, the pale's not going to go out on time or everything's going to fall down. Sure. I would think the probably biggest obstacle to, to slowing down would be the opposite of what you ask them to do, which is they don't have the time to slow down. So what, what advice would you give or what steps can they take to in order for them to be able to create that, that sure, time. Sure. Yeah, look, I don't have the time is definitely one of the biggest complaints that we can have. And the thing about time is time is not actually real. We're going to get a little bit deep here, but time is an illusion. We make time up. If you think I'm lying, show me time. Point to it. If I say it's, there's no time, that's a story. We believe the story that we're making up. So in the story called There's No Time, guess what? No, not, <laughs> there's no time. no time exactly when you really believe there's no time you're just going to be you know like spinning your wheel and, and doing all the things you have to do because you know what there's no time to do anything else so consider that there is no time there's not enough time it's just made up it's not real and if you can just try that and kind of park that for a minute then engage in 
where can I create the time, get connected to something? Maybe that's something you would do before work. Okay. Maybe that's something you would do in the evening. Sure. Absolutely. It could be something that you take in your break. And this is the thing about, you know, when you're out there working in an organization, you've got to take breaks. Sure. You have to take breaks. Give yourself that headspace. Yeah. You know, you've got to, you know, another thing I work with coaches on or I work with directors or other people that I work with is how they can manage energy rather than just managing time. Sure. Right? If I've got time in my calendar, I'll slot it in. If I can squeeze that meeting in, I will do it. But they don't look from the point of view of, do I have the energy for that? So what happens is they'll cram a lot of stuff in and there's a lot of quantity, but the quality goes down. The energy is low, the focus is low. Maybe you didn't eat your lunch that day. Maybe you're still stressed from the fact that you've had seven meetings back to back and you're just literally grinding out the day. It's really important to have enough rest and recovery. You're giving me a visual here. This might sound a bit weird, so bear with me. But So it's a bit like if we all had a battery we could physically see on mm-hmm. everybody's in person yeah. and you could see when they're high and when they're low, yeah. then we would manage our expectations on the individual differently. As an example, if I've got an iPhone and I know I've got 3% battery left, I will use my iPhone differently when I have 3% battery exactly. left than I will when I've got 100% because I know I want that to last a little bit longer. Yeah. So I guess what you're saying, well, if I understand it correctly, is one of the things we don't have access to is being able to see everyone's energy levels and their battery levels. And when you're on low, actually, you just need to recharge. Absolutely. Einstein famously said that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We believe it's time to try a new approach to recruitment. JGA Recruitment specialise in recruiting the top 50 15% of payroll and HR talent using innovative 24-7 attraction strategies that are proven to improve quality of hire, candidate retention and return on investment. De-risk your recruitment process today and hire better talent faster with JGA Recruitment. Visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Success is an outcome. Happiness is an outcome. Follow me? Yeah. An outcome is also known as a result. So sure. consider that if you boiled it all down, we are having this conversation because you want to create a result that you get to make a difference to people that's listening. The people that are listening, they're listening because there's a, a result they want. They might want a new insight. They might want some thought provoking stuff to challenge them or help them develop sure. or some entertainment. When I go and boil the kettle, I want a result. Everything that we do is to have a result, whether it's big, small, meaningful or not. We are results driven human beings. So The trick is to be really clear about the results that you want because there's so many results in life and there's results that matter. There are results that really matter. So I could share stories about, you know, this guy did X and Y and he earned this amount of money or he had this amount of success. But in my experience, they're not the results that mattered the most. The kind of results that I saw people create and coach them into having are very profound emotional results. I think, you know, whether you work in payroll, human resources, or any industry, no matter who you are, what your walk of life is, life can be really tough. Yeah. Like, it can be really tough. Yeah. And at different times, we're hit with that toughness, and sometimes you just got to, you know, we try and work through it sometimes. And as you say, maybe that taking a break and reflecting can really help. One major thing you talk about on your website is that you've discovered on your journey through basically being immersed in personal development is that the thrilling ride we call life is a created phenomenon. What do you mean by Mm. that? Yeah. All right. Great question. Personally speaking, I never related to myself as somebody who was creative. Okay. I couldn't draw for toffee. If I did try, it would look like I was a four year old kid. Right. (laughs) And I used to assign being creative to the ability to draw or somehow be a graphic designer. Sure. In my own crazy little world, in my head, that's what I thought being creative was. You know, we create crazy ideas in our heads right so that was one of mine that I had growing up so because you relate to yourself in a certain way like that you're not creative it's almost like you've made that decision you're in the box the door's shut and that's the end of the story right and this is what happened for me but through my life I've started to realize that there's wow there's so many ways that you can be creative there's so many expressions of being creative and it's not limited to x or y and the work that I do with people is to get them to see that Everything that's going on in their life, and I don't just mean the physical world, but I mean really internally, it's all made up. Now, when I say it's all made up, you know, we really live in a world where things are happening and then we'll make up a decision about that. We'll have an opinion about that. We'll have a view about that. We'll have an interpretation about that. And the the author of all of that is us. We are making it all up. Sure. Right. And so essentially we're already creating our world through our interpretations, perceptions, opinions and views. But most of us don't really know that we're doing it. We live in a world that our views, interpretations and perceptions are the truth. Then what do you do with something that you made up that's not true? We disregard it. Yeah. You can just pop it to the side. Sure. Now, when you pop it to the side, disregard it or or just kind of like 
acknowledge that it's not true, it gives you a space. And what can you do with space? Well, you can achieve more results based on your <laughs> previous analogy. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, I guess it changes the parameters of, of expectation as well. And yeah. the things that you put on yourself. So something that I picked up from what you just mentioned there is in payroll, there's a, a dichotomy, if you like, between whether the industry is undervalued or whether in recent times it's become elevated. And I don't know what the answer is necessarily. I think both is probably true. But it's very easy to fall into the camp of it's undervalued. It's very easy to fall into the trap, rather, of it's never going to be respected like HR. It's never going to be respected like finance. And I guess if you tell yourself that enough times, then it becomes true. Absolutely. And actually, behind the scenes, it's gained chartered status. Yeah. Um, there are many more payroll people at, you know, sitting at board tables now and salaries increase and all sorts of things. So that does resonate. Yeah. And look, consider that it's only true for you. Sure. It's not true in the world, like a fact. This table is true. Okay, we are recording our voices into a microphone. That's actually happening. That's the glass with water. These things are real, but we are undervalued is a story, but it will be true for the person who is telling themselves that, who views themselves as that, or who believes that. So what would you say is the main kind of complaint for people in payroll then? It's about comparing it to the other industries that they are, right. or professionals they work alongside. Human resources and finance being two. So you feel undervalued in comparative terms yeah. to an HR director, if yeah. you're a payroll director or yeah. a finance director. Yeah. Your voice perhaps isn't as valued or perceived to be as valued by the major stakeholders, CEO, CFO, as it might be, mm. as an HR director might have or a payroll director or sorry, a finance director might have. Mm. It's being contextualized by comparing it to other functions. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So I would just say stop comparing it. That's <laughs> the first thing. Don't compare yourself. And I would also say, what is it that you want to create? Because right now what's being created is we're not as important as HR. We don't get as valued as X or Y, right? That could be true for that organization. It could be true for you. It could be true for many people in the world, right? And you can create something else. My question would be, if we could consider that that's just a story that's being made up and literally hang out with me here, right? Let's play a game. Imagine that we could pop that to the side. What would you, in your role with payroll or your role, what would you want to create instead of that story? I don't know the answer to that at the moment. I probably need a little bit more thought. Yeah. I think we get too bogged down in the comparison without the analysis behind why that comparison is important. I would even say getting bogged down in the why is, is going to bog you down even more as well. I, I would just say, look, what is it that you want to create that payroll is, you know, I don't know. What, what, what would you imagine knowing that world? I don't know the world too well, but what would you think that somebody in payroll would love to create regarding payroll? I think being a function that ultimately handles or spends more money a business function than any other function probably has access to. A successful business can only be successful if you're of a certain size and stature. Let's say you've got over 500 employees. You can only really be successful going forward in terms of growth and development, and recruitment of staff, everything, if the payroll function is run correctly. Yeah. If I run a payroll function, I'm not a payroll manager, I, I recruit for payroll people, but if I have a payroll function and I consistently pay people incorrectly, the knock-on effect of that is the staff are going to lose. It doesn't matter what function they work in. You could be yeah. working in surveillancing, store manager, you know, with CEO, whatever. They're all going to eventually get fed up with being paid in quality, and they're going to go. So payroll actually has a direct effect on the turnover, attrition, success, ability to recruit in other areas. Mm. It actually has a really profound effect on a, a business's ability to perform optimally or to grow. But I don't think... Even in my experience as a recruiter, and I recruit for human resources and for payroll, so I see both sides. I don't think that's necessarily appreciated as it could be. But in addition to that, payroll is very fast changing. So legislation changes all the time. You've got to be on the ball. You, again, if you're not on those things, then the fines that businesses can receive, the ability that they can then, you know, in terms of their brand image could be affected, ability to recruit going forward. All of those knock-on effects can happen if a payroll professional isn't on you know, up to speed with the legislative changes, with yeah. ensuring that everything is run correctly and, and compliantly. And I think they just, you know, I'm speaking for them here, and I'm not even a payroll person, but I recruit for them, and I, and I hear the stories come back, but I think they just want a little bit more recognition at board level, I think, yeah. public eye level, to say, look, we have a really important job to do, and we are essential to the success and growth of your business. And as a result of that, actually, I have lots of opinions and views that could elevate your business further that could improve bottom line, efficiency, savings, costs, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Give me a budget 
give me the the rope to go and do those things. Yeah, that's great. So look, um, just a couple of things about what you said. So imagine the football team. There's the defenders and the attackers. There's no sense in comparing the defenders and the attackers. If the defender starts comparing themselves to the attackers, they'll get a little bit lost because they're not attackers. And if the attacker starts comparing themselves to the defenders, they'll get a little bit lost because they're not defenders. And what they're good at is being impacted by some concern or comparison to something else. It doesn't make any difference. Essentially, the defenders and the attackers are part of a team. They're part of a whole. Yeah. Not one is more important than the other. Not one. All right? Because every part of that team is contributing to the success. You know, you could be the best attacker in the world, but if you've got the worst defence, you'll lose as many games as you win. So the comparison is a very... It's something that we do. It's in our nature to compare. Okay, we compare ourselves to our big brothers. We compare ourselves to our colleagues, our co-founders, and the other departments. But it's a very futile approach to effectiveness. So I would just let go of the comparison. That'd be one thing. And if you can do that, it will really free you up to focus on your strengths and acknowledge that without HR, right, all of a sudden you're starting to look at it as a whole, as a team, rather than being like, we're here and they are there. Okay, us versus them. So I would just really consider just letting all of that go because it won't work and it won't help anybody. Um, you know, one of the biggest things in any relationship, one of the biggest complaints is being underappreciated. Family, marriages, and at work. Okay, the experience of being underappreciated. You know, one of the practical steps I suggest people take is to have a conversation, like really get in communication and make it really clear what it is that you feel underappreciated about and then have a request. You know, in the context of a business, it would be a meeting. It's going to be created in a safe way because HR will be feeling underappreciated at certain levels. Okay, we all experience it. If you can take that into a business, and this is what I do for companies as well, like have conversations that really make a difference. And that means creating a safe space to, you know, be a bit more vulnerable than maybe you're used to and just laying it out there in a way that can be looked at, can be discussed so that everybody starts working together. You know, some some kind of practical idea there that, that could really make a difference. No, that's great. It's good to get practical advice. So we have to allow ourselves and find a way to get connected to what matters, what's important to us, and then find a way to communicate it to the people that are involved or that, that need to hear it. So if there's something going on in a payroll department that's important to them, find a way that it can be communicated effectively with the right people. And then, again, like I said earlier, work it out together. Sure. Excellent advice. Thanks, Simon. We may as well talk about the book now. I think it's a good, good lead-in. So uh, we mentioned you, you're working on completing your first book. And at the moment, it has a working title of Holy Future, How to Create Any Results in Your Business and Your Life. So tell the listeners a little bit more about book and I guess why it might help them with some of the practical steps and, and, and advice that might be contained in that book that they can take away yeah great as I said earlier the results driven we are results orientated and I've always been somebody that's out to cause results so, uh, you know I'm, I'm an action man I'm an action taker but I started to engage in a question like what is the source of results if results are what we're all about and everything we do is to cause a result big small meaningful or not what is the source of the results that I'm getting? Now, if I ask the question, like, what's the source of results? Most commonly, the answer is action. Okay, I take an action, I get a result. But consider that that's just the first level of the source of results. And the source of results is very, very deep. And it goes one, two, three layers deeper than action. So the book is an inquiry and an exploration into what the source of results actually is all the way to the bottom. And this is results for human beings, right? Not just results in the world, but results specifically for us. There's a process. I'll talk people through and explain what that source is. I try and do it in a very simplified way. And then once it's really understood why we do what we do, what drives us to do X or Y, and what's having us get those results, then there's a seven-step process that you can apply to any area of your business, any area of your life, it can be applied at individual level or at group level, and it will take you through everything that's going on in that area right now because there'll be things that you're doing that are not working, things that are you're doing that are getting in your way, and then all the things below that that are contributing to those actions. So that's kind of like the past, all right? And we're going to literally get rid of that. We're going to make space to create a new future because we're all driven by results, but we're also driven by a possible future, right? We get excited by where we're heading in life, and, you know, if we're not excited, it's probably because we haven't created an inspiring future. So the process itself, seven steps that will allow you to create a future in such a way that 
the actions be, start to become very natural. I definitely think everything we do is, is driven by the desire and needs to be successful. I'll use the word successful, I'll use the word results, but uh, mm-hmm. those, I'm all talk yeah. about those seven steps in a little bit more detail as well. But look, how we measure success and in what field, I get is completely individual, but let's just say I'm a payroll person, mm-hmm. I'm working as a payroll administrator, and I would like to get to, let's say, payroll director level yeah. with board level responsibilities. If that's what I told you in our first meeting, that was my goal. How would you interpret that and what advice would you give me? Well, the first question I would ask is why? That I want to be deemed to be successful in my career. And for me, that is a career progressive pathway of promotion. You know, I'd be digging deeper into why. Why is success important to you? I'd be looking to get all the way to the bottom of what is it that is important to you personally that is wanting to create that result? That works in a couple of different ways. It has me get to be clear about what drives you. And it has you get to be clear about what drives you, because what is essentially driving any of us is whatever is important to us. Whatever we have decided, whatever we have created is the most important to us, because that's what's shaping the whole thing. So, you know, I want to get really, really deep into why. What is it? What's your why? Why is that important to you? Then we start to create. Okay, so if that's where you want to get, what are the basic actions that you would need to take? And then we would develop a strategy. And we want to develop a strategy that just breaks the whole thing down to one tiny action at a time, right? Because we've got a big game that's obviously inspiring that person. So we need the right strategy. And then we need the right views of that because they might have a view like nobody wants them to do that role or they're not capable of doing that role or, you know, there's not enough opportunities to do that. There'll be some view that they've got that is inhibiting them or holding them back. And we'll explore that as well. So... Everything that they need to set themselves up to really have that future happen, I would run them through that creative process that I've mentioned. I haven't really went through it. It's it's quite a detailed process, but I'd be taking them through that process so that they know exactly what's important to them, what's driving them, what the kind of view is that's going to have them take the actions that they want to take. What are the actions? And then, of course, take the actions. That was quite unique because they're dealing with wages, right? So Mm -hmm. they see... They're dealing with money all the time. They can see what people are earning within a business. Yeah. Um, so their idea of value within an organization perhaps is slightly different to an individual who might work in a different function. You can kind of measure your value internally by the fact that you know what other people are earning. So yeah. it's slightly unique in that sense. And I guess if I said that I, know I wanted to get to pay direct level because I want to earn more money, I'm a big believer that money is just an enabler. Yeah. Money doesn't make you happy. Sure. It just enables you to do some of the things that, that potentially could make you happier. But I know there's been some studies taken where after a certain figure actually happens doesn't increase so you can earn up to a certain level and there are yeah. things that actually under a certain level you can be unhappy and not to a certain level then you, you keep going but when you go over a certain level happiness level doesn't increase what are your views on financial or money being connected or associated with happiness you know again it's a very much a society thing isn't it like you know it's all about how much you can do in life or you know that we can have it all and what it means about you if you have it all or what it means about you if you don't. And we are constantly impacted in life by what everybody else thinks about us. Status. Yeah. You know, we we worry more about looking good in other people's eyes than actually dying. So because of, you know, the status that comes with money and every decision or, you know, what it must mean about you if you've got enough money or plenty of money, then that's a main driver for people. Right. It's, it's the fear of not being appreciated. It's not it's the fear of not being accepted. It's the fear of not being valued. A big fear of not being good enough which drives a lot of people to accomplish certain levels of income. What we really, really want is fulfillment. What we really, really want is a sense of peace of mind and freedom. And there'll be certain lifestyles that we want as well. And everything, you know, each to their own, everybody's got an individual perception of what that would look like for them. So pardon the pun, but money doesn't buy you happiness. You know, happiness is very much an intrinsic thing that goes on inside of you. But if you associate money to your happiness, then you'll always be lost because no matter how much money you earn, that won't be it. And then you need to earn more and that won't be it. And what happens is with people that go through this process, they realize that they they thought it was all about money. They get to that amount. They try and get more. It's just like, this isn't it. One of the things I talk about in my book is it's the seven sources. It's a model for balance, harmony and a fulfilling life. So I really believe that if you live intentionally from these seven areas that you're going to have balance, harmony and fulfillment. And one of those areas is work. One of those areas is having income aligned with your self-worth. But that's just one of those areas. There's many other short parts of life. So it's really, really important that we get clear about what's important. It's not just being successful 
in work. It's being successful in our health. It's being successful in our relationships. It's being successful in our social communities, right? It's, it's having healthy, productive outcomes in all those different areas that are important to us. I think that's a, a really fantastic way to, to end the first few questions. Thanks for that. We've gone into some detail, which is great. Time to find out more about you. So how would your friends describe you and how would your work colleagues describe you? They would definitely describe me as impulsive. They just don't understand I'm an action taker. <laughs> I wear my heart on my sleeve. I can have a bit of a fiery temper because I have red hair. And, you know, even though I'm a personal development coach, I can <laughs> openly admit that I can, you know, my emotions can come up at times in, in certain situations. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. So tell me something about you perhaps other people won't know. Okay. So something about me that other people won't know is that I would say my life up until I was 30, it was just dogged with failure. The failure became personal. I made failure mean that I was a failure. And that's why I had to stop and start something else because I'm not, I wasn't going to be able to do that one because I'm not good enough to do it, right? I'm the failure. And it was a really important process for me to go through because I know that a lot of people, they're either stopped by failure to the point where they won't even try. Or as soon as they have a failure, they'll probably do what I did and quit. But what I've learned through that journey is that failure is actually the magic ingredient of success. You cannot succeed without failure. Success is not a straight line from start to end. There's a process and it's a process that I teach people. It's called try, fail, repeat, succeed. If you try and you fail and you don't repeat, you're not going to succeed. There's a famous quote out there, I think. Um, I'm not sure who you may know better than me who said it, but I think it says something on the lines of the most successful people in the world are those that have failed the most. Yeah, and they understand this process that it's try, fail, repeat, succeed. They intrinsically know that. You know, in every failure, it's an opening to learn something. It's an opening to grow. It's an opening to develop. But so often people interpret it as it means that they are a failure mm. rather than they just failed at that thing. If anybody else finds out that we've tried and failed or that we are a failure, then you know what? My life is over. It's one of the things I work with uh, with people a lot and I'm out to really shift that view that failure is a magic ingredient of success. It doesn't mean you're a failure. Fantastic. So next question, you've been abducted by aliens. All right. They want to learn more about our species. What item do you take with you? I'm torn between a very, very good coffee machine. Sure coffee with them. I'm very passionate about my coffee. Or I am. I think pale people can probably resonate with the coffee machine. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit of a coffee snob, so I think I'm going to go with coffee machine. I'm going to make them the best latte with the, you know, the finest Brazilian coffee that I can find. Excellent answer. <laughs> what game or instrument do you teach them? I think I'd probably have to teach them hide and seek. Hide and seek. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. That's cool. What do you tell them about humans? It's quite a big question for someone who works in coaching. Sure. I tell them that we are incredible human beings very much in the infancy of experience in the world and we're trying our best and still learning. Excellent. And what truth or human trait would you hold back from telling them? Oh boy, against my religion, this. Let's see. My answer would be none. Nothing. You'd tell them everything. Everything. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Fantastic. So look, we're going to go back into the, uh, into the questions. Five quick questions. You've talked a little bit already about your seven-step process. I know it can be applied to any area of business or to personal life. So yeah. can you give me a little bit more information regarding the seven steps and whether or not there's anything a pale professional can start implementing now yeah. to develop themselves? Yeah. themselves? Okay, great question. All right, cool. So look, can I just take you through something? Sure. And I'll basically show you. We've looked at this question, what's the source of results, right? So I'm going to explain to you or show you in your experience what it actually is. So I'm going to show you something and then we'll bring it back to this question and we'll try and tie it up in a nice bow, right? So let's imagine that you have been walking around, Nick, you, yep. for four hours, yep. right? You've been walking around for ages and you walk into a coffee shop. The coffee shop is busy. There's one chair available. You've been walking around for four hours. There's a way that that chair looks to you. I don't mean it's physical attributes, but I mean your view of the chair. What is that view? Appealing because I'm tired and I've been walking around for four hours. Presumably I have shopping if I'm in shopping. I'm... Ready for a break. Great. And then your action. What action might you take? Well, the first thing I want to do is probably rush to go and get that single chair. Exactly. And what's in your way of being? And I don't mean like in your way. I mean, what's the way that you are being? Because remember, we are all human beings. Excited. Okay. Uh, relieved. What's the result? I have a chair in a coffee shop. I can relax. I can rest. I can get my coffee. I can just take stock. Take that moment you were talking about earlier. Taking yeah. that headspace. Taking yeah. that moment. Just uh, meditative, if you like, Great. relaxation. Okay, perfect, right? So let's imagine it's a new day. 
you've just walked out of the house, you walk into the coffee shop, there's one chair available again, and this time your train leaves in five minutes. When you walk into the coffee shop, what is your view of the chair this time? I'm not interested in the chair. I'm interested in getting served quickly. My train leaves in five minutes. And the way that you're then being? Rushed. Mm -hmm. And Um, the action that you take? It's hasty. It's quick. Then maybe the barista's taking too long. I don't know. I'd be agitated. If I was five minutes on my train, then I want to make sure I got my coffee in time. Yeah. So I guess I'd have that that nervous energy of ensuring that what I've asked for comes in time so I can still get my train. I'd be be anxious that I maybe may miss my train if if I get this one. Yeah. So that's all part of the way that you're being. And then the action would be? To ignore the chair. And? Not sit in it. What would you do? I'll get my coffee. You get your coffee. Get my coffee. Yeah, get my coffee and I'll go. Okay, good. All right, perfect. Right, so what's the point, right? So the point is in life, there's so much happening in life. We're interpreting all this information and data. We're taking actions. We're being a certain way because we're we're never taking an action not being a certain way because we're human beings, okay? We're always being a certain way. It could be committed, excited, nervous, sad, happy, all of that stuff, right? That whole spectrum. And then we're taking actions to cause results, right? Now, all of those actions and those results, they're all consistent with the way something looks, right? In the first example, the chair looked appealing, which had you be relieved. And then you take the action called take the chair. Sure. Then you got the result. The way that something looks is consistent with what's important to you. In the first example, you'd been walking around for four hours. So what naturally was important to you is to get some relaxed time to get some rest. Then the chair looks a certain way. Then you are being a certain way and you take a certain action. Sure. And then you get a certain result. The next day, is trying to get to work. So what's important to you is now changed. You don't want to sit down. So you see the same chair, but it doesn't even show up. You don't even notice it. Your being is different. Your actions are different and your results different. So if you change what's important, it automatically changes the way something looks, which automatically changes the way that you're being, the actions that you take, and ultimately the results that you get. So the source of results is essentially what's important to you as a human being. So you change what's important, you change the way that the world looks, which changes your actions, your ways of being, and the results. We go through life and things are important, right? Sometimes we get caught up in things that are important, but we're not really that important. We do that a lot, right? If we live our life as close to the line of what's most important as possible, we'll be happy. We'll be successful. The source of what is most important to you as a human being is space. When there's no space, there's a lot of noise. And when there's a lot of noise, everything's kind of like survival. It's all about surviving. And then when you're surviving, when when survival is most important, everything looks like some sort of a threat. Is it well-known saying of being on the treadmill? Yeah, exactly. We get on the treadmill. Yeah, and we're spinning our wheels. So in a world of surviving, everything looks like it's a threat. And then all of your ways of being and the actions that you take are all coming from... (sighs) That place. Okay, I've got to get to work. I've got to get the money. I've got to pay the rent. Blah, blah, blah. I've got to get in a relationship. I've got to get out of a relationship. It's constant, right? And the experience of life is so exhausting that there's not a lot of space to be connected to what is most important to you. That's why it's very common that, yeah, family is important, but how often have people, you know, shared their story that, you know, they weren't there for their kids or that they've just spent the last six months and they missed this and they missed that mm. because something else became more important. But when push came to shove, it wasn't that. And then they realize and then they start to have a different view and take different actions. So space is the source of being connected to what's most important. How we get space is to slow things down. So this links right back to the first question. Yes. Slow down. Slow down. The first implementable step you would give to someone then is slow down. You know, times that I get my best ideas or, you know, if I'm writing parts of my book or creating content, my best ideas come at 4 a.m. in the morning. Because at 4 a.m. in the morning, there's no distractions. There's just so much quietness. And there's so much space and you start to really get connected to the things that are most important before life goes crazy. Sure. And before work's coming at you and sure. responsibilities. And really that's essentially because that's when there is space available. You're not being on your phone. You're not distracted. You're not watching telly. No, but that's cool. that is the source of the results that matter the most. But it's a practical it's step people can take. They can listen and go, okay, what is important to me? I do need to slow down, take some time. Yeah. Turn off your phone. Turn off the telly, shut the door, sit in silence. And it'll be weird for most people. People actually do this naturally anyway. You've probably said, I need to go around and clear my head. Or I'm not going to make a decision right now. I'm going to sleep on it. Or let me mull that over. Um, I just need to kind of get some space to figure it out. So what I'm telling you is not new, right? We intrinsically know it, but we don't know it like the way that we could know it. If you want to create a result or things aren't really working for you in your life, then the chances are there's not enough space. 
And that's the time to slow down. And you'll get connected to what's important. Everything will start to look differently and you'll know the action to take. Excellent. Fantastic. So look, in terms of your coaching, you coach directors, entrepreneurs, actors, uh, all walks of life, all professions. Yeah. One thing that you have been passionate about and, and you have experience in is developing what you've termed as unstoppable leaders. Yeah. So what does leadership mean to you? And if I was wanted to be an unstoppable leader myself yeah. um, in payroll, HR, whatever it might be, what should I be doing or considering now to get there in the future? Okay, so look, if you're a leader, you know that you're out there leading the way, right? Now that means if, if something's not going to go right or fail or not work, you're going to be the one at the, at the front end of that, right? So one of the fundamental as, um, aspects of being a, a leader that really makes things happen is when things are not working, when things are failing, that you're able to bounce back over and over and over again. Otherwise, you'll quit and you'll shut up shop and then that was it. There's no progress, there's no success. So I'm really passionate about being, this idea about being unstoppable. I love that. So you've got to be able to bounce back. You know, there's a few different facets, I believe, of being a quality leader. One of them is being authentic. You know, it's being able to own that you are a human being. You're not perfect. You don't have all the answers. You will make mistakes and that's all right. Being authentic. Another thing is you know, having integrity. So if you're, if you say you're going to do something, you get it done, or at least let people know when you're not. A real asset, a real quality aspect of being a leader is being the kind of person that you can be relied on. When you say something, it happens. Another thing is this thing that we've spoke about already, responsibility. In life, the more that we can be willing to be responsible, and I don't mean like we are responsible, like it's the truth, but it's like the willingness to just be like, you know what, I may as well come at this like I'm responsible for the whole thing anyway. Why? Because you're going to have more power, you'll take more effective actions and you'll cause more results. And it takes a huge person to be able to do that. Sure. Um, so what we have, we have responsibility, unstoppableness, uh, reliability, integrity. And I think the last piece is it's really important to be able to give back and to have a purpose that's bigger than just your immediate world. I believe that's a real quality aspect of being a leader, like really contributing to the world. It might be your local community. It could be some other part of the world, but having a purpose that's bigger than just yourself. So if I was a payroll professional and I'm going into an interview scenario then, okay, yeah. um, and I want to become a payroll supervisor or team leader, nine times out of 10, the payroll manager or HR manager might turn around and say, look, you don't have any experience as a team leader. And it's that chicken and egg, you know, you, you want to become a leader, but you haven't got the experience. Yeah. You can't get the experience because it goes around the circles. So some of the hacks then, I guess that you're advising, if I was getting into that interview scenario and I don't have that experience, is if I was saying or wants to uh, become a good leader and hopefully secure that role, even though I don't have the experience, is being honest with the interviewer and saying, mm -hmm. look, I am authentic. I'll be reliable. I'll be responsible. I'll run this role with integrity. I will give back and take responsibility for my actions. If you give that kind of response, that should, I would hope, if you don't have the experience, be enough to give confidence to the recruiting people in that, in that office, in that room, to say, actually, yeah, this individual knows what it takes to be an yeah. unstoppable leader. The way that you might want to answer is be like, look, these are the things that are important to me. When stuff's going wrong, I won't stop. You know, if there's an issue, I'll be as responsible as possible to have it go the right way. If I say I'm going to do something, I'll get it done. And, you know, I have a bigger purpose as well. Like I really, again, these are things that I'm in answering to your question, like what are fundamental aspects of leadership? Is the idea of being responsible and being fully powerful, does that light you up? Is being able to be human rather than perfect, does that light you up? Being somebody who's reliable, is that something that really turns you on? So, you know, get connected to what's important to you as a leader. If what I'm saying resonates, use them. But don't just say them in the interview. Actually try living that way. Sure. And then in the interview, you're not just saying, let me give you an example of yeah. what happened. And do you know what? I decided to be responsible and this is how it went because I did that. Or let me tell you a time where I said I was going to get something done. Everybody else said it wasn't possible. I stuck to my word and this is what happened. So, you know, start living your life from there. Live that way in your relationships. Live that way at home. And then you have real experiences to share rather than like the BS that can sometimes come from because people think, that what's important is to be perfect. Next question. You work in payroll. You tend to deal with 
a lot of complaints mm. because that's why people will tend to call my pay's not right, whatever it might be. So I know you've got strong feelings on the psychology behind the act of complaining. Mm. And I read in one of your articles that we need to remember that complaining is the symptom, not the cure, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. So with this in mind, I wondered if you could share some of your views with the listeners and if possible, if you have any more strategies or advice, sure. practical steps perhaps that you can offer for handling complaints and yeah. negativity. Yeah, yeah, great question. This is one of my favourite areas to talk about because we love to complain. Human beings love it. First of all, you've got to understand what is that complaint really all about when a human being is complaining. So the complaint is the symptom of something. It's like a sign of something. And the sign that it is, is that for that human being underneath something, there's some sort of a perceived danger for them, right? So because there's a danger for them, their way of dealing with it is to complain about it. And then of course, somebody or something is wrong. And then the person who's receiving it will tend to take that personally if they're not trained well enough, you know, if they're not aware enough. And then they will probably start defending or attacking. And then you get into this kind of squabble, right? Sure. So that's what happens in the, in the real world with people and human beings. So really, you've got to understand that behind every complaint, there's a danger. So for anybody dealing with complaints, you've got to just really understand it's not personal. And what is the danger for them? So what's the typical complaint? Typically in payroll, I'd imagine it would be my payroll is incorrect. Yeah. Well, of course, the money is important to people. So sure. if I've been paid incorrectly, I'm going to call and say, I need this money. I've got a mortgage to pay. I've got yeah. rent to pay. Yeah. And it's all your fault because you do my payroll. Yeah. So they, so they experience, I guess, being at the brunt of whatever happened, right? So it's not their fault and nothing is wrong. That's the first thing to get, right? But we human beings, we go there so fast that we take it all personally. So if you're in payroll, it's not personal. That's the first thing to get. The complaint from your colleague is not personal to you. Even though you may have made the mistake, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or that you're not good enough at your job. You made a mistake because you're a human being, right? Sure. Okay, every human being makes mistakes. And the person making the complaint to you would have also made several mistakes already that day. Some they know about, some they don't. Sure. We all make mistakes. That's the first thing. Don't have it be personal. The second thing is understand that behind their complaint, that person is dealing with some sort of a danger. Now, what would be the typical danger? So I get it that they've not been paid enough or accurately, but what's the danger behind that? Or well, potentially for them, maybe paying rent, paying a mortgage, paying a bill, yep. with ramifications of a non-payment yep. somewhere or money they owe, whatever yep. it might be. And then what's the danger of that? If you go to the nth degree, I guess yeah. if you don't pay your mortgage or you don't pay your rent, then yeah. you damages your credit rating, you can yeah. lose your house. You yeah. Can... yeah. Now, if you lose your house, what's the danger in that? And you're homeless. Exactly, right? So okay. really, what they've got to get is the real danger for people is they believe in their subconscious mind, this danger to them is that they're essentially going to end up homeless all the way to the bottom. That's what's underneath this complaint. Now, if you're in the payroll dealing with this, you know, I would invite you to just have some understanding of that and some compassion for that. Like they really believe in that moment that their whole existence is being threatened because sure. they haven't been paid the accurate amount. So if you can just get that, it will allow you to really be with their complaint because they really believe that's what's the danger. And essentially it is, but it's actually a very, very tiny percentage of, of risk, isn't it? That they're going to end up homeless because their payroll sure. was wrong. But in the back of their mind, that's what they're really fighting against. And it's an extreme example. I mean, it could also be, I guess, well, I was planning to go out this evening. Yeah. You haven't paid me, so now I can't go out. Yeah, and, and if you can't go out, what's the danger in that? Uh, FOMO. So that's what people are dealing with in these complaints. It's, it's all a personal danger for them personally, right? It's very rarely a real physical threat to their life, but they, they act like it is, like it's a real you know, survival moment for exacerbates. Yeah, yeah. So you just got to get that, which should really free people up to be able to be with people's complaints. All right. Now, the second way I would frame this is if you're the guy on the other end of the phone to somebody who's having like a real life crisis and you can be the person that can support them and you can be the person that can help them through that. What a great thing to offer somebody. I think that's why payroll people are really, really good as well. And yeah. they are very, very good at doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So what an amazing thing to provide. So not only are they the, like a major cog in the wheel of providing the security in a certain lifestyle because they're function, but they're also able to deal with the emotional stress when it goes wrong. That's a great role to play, isn't it? I think also, you won't be familiar because you're not in the payroll world, Ryan, but this is also why manual payroll skills are still so important. Mm -hmm. Because if I phone you my payroll as well, well, I don't want to hear on the other end of the phone and saying, I need to check the system. Something's yeah. wrong with the system. Yeah. If you're able to sit down and, and therefore you're already blaming something else, you know, you're not taking responsibility for the complaint. But if you're able to work through 
the pay slip, manually calculate it using tax tables and actually yeah. see where the errors may or may not lie. Yeah. Utilising that practical payroll experience that is so important for, yeah. for the true payroll professional. I think that's um, a really good way for the payroll listeners at the moment out there to, to understand why those practical payroll and manual calculation skills are still incredibly yeah. important, yeah. even though there's a huge rise in robotic process automation that does yeah. everything for you. Now, fantastic answer. Thanks. Okay. Thanks Just that. one other piece to that. If anybody's struggling with dealing with complaints, I would you know, really think about a way that they could respond to that initial complaint. There's just ways that you can really interact with that that can just diffuse the bomb, even though it kind of already went off. And that's, I mean, if it was me, I'd just say, listen, I'm so sorry that this has happened. Let's work it out. We're going to get to the bottom of this. And whatever problem has been created, whatever error, we'll get it sorted as soon as possible. And that will just take the sting out of it because that person on the phone, the only one to know that you're going to solve their problem. Sure. So let them know up front that you get their concern. Listen, this must be really frustrating and worrying. And thanks for calling me. I'm sorry this has happened. Let's get to the bottom of it so that whatever error has been created will get corrected. That person wants to know up front that you're going to help solve their problem. So just let them know that you're going to do that and they will be more on your side. They'll be more relaxed. And then all of a sudden you're dealing with a different kind of human being. That will make your job so much easier. So here, the power managers out there or anyone else can rewind this little bit of the podcast. Yeah. Record that little bit of snippet yeah. there by Ryan. Yeah. Add it into your scripts when someone calls for a complaint yeah. and you're happy yeah. to go. I've actually noticed that Apple are training their staff in this now. So if Got you it. ever call Apple, the staff, they go too far. But you'll tell them what your problem is. And what Apple will do, they'll repeat your problem back to you. Ah, I see that your Mac has no longer been working and that means that you're frustrated because you can't get your work done. And then they'll they'll say whatever emotion that you that they believe you're having. And you do get the sense that they get you and that's what you want. You know, human interactions, if you can get people's concern and recreate their concern, all of a sudden somebody feels understood and you've got a completely different Just diffuses person. it. Absolutely. Excellent. So that probably flipped down its head slightly then. So I'm a pale professional and I've got I'm the one with the complaint. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps I've talked about it a little bit already and I'm probably doing an HR a huge disservice here because some HR and payroll functions have fantastic relationships Great. so apologies it could be a finance director is the yeah. same but perhaps in this particular instance I feel like my HR director isn't giving me the budget respect voice or perhaps even the promotion maybe even pay pay is important that yeah. I deserve how should I handle that type of inner complaint well I think the way that it, that's what's going on with you internally automatically be like a loss of power Right, because you're not getting what you should be getting, and and that would be quite exasperating, right? So I would just, if that's an experience that you can relate to, I would just pause that one, and I'd be like, okay, I would reframe that to be there's something I'm missing that I'm not doing. That if I did it, I would get that reward. Okay, and then I would engage in that question: What is it that I haven't been doing? And then I would take that question to my manager, and I'd say something like, Look, yeah, I'm really committed to getting this promotion, and I want to know from you what do you think I need to do more of. What do you think I need to do less of? What is it that I'm missing that if I put it in, I would start being considered considered seriously for this promotion? Tell me what I need to do. So lack of less of I want, I want, I want, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve, and exactly. more of what am I not doing? What exactly, do? that's the responsibility piece. You just empower yourself rather than you know becoming a victim. One of them, you've got your hands on the driving wheel. The other one, you're blindfolded and you're just about to crash. Should we be brave enough to get the uh, director involved to commit to timeframes? Should I say, well, if I achieve X by Y, then we should be with you? Or is that too... This is a great question because it's all about people at the end of the day. If you get that guy excited about something, he's going to be on your page. So I wouldn't be like, okay, I want a timeline and this is how it needs to go. But I'd be like, look, I have a great idea. Here's what would really work for me. I want to have this promotion by September. In an ideal world, I would love that to happen. And I know I need to jump through hoops to make it happen. I love that. I love the challenge. Can we create a commitment together that if I do X and Y by then, that I could have the promotion? Or what would work for you? Okay, great. Fantastic. Then you're creating team. He's now on board. And you're working together to exactly. achieve your goal. Rather than like demanding, making him wrong for anything or being a victim. Brilliant strategy. Excellent. Fantastic. Now, I read an article that you wrote where you described a problem a director was having when it came to recruiting top level talent. Now, recruiting top talent in payroll is also a really tough challenge. It's why people use specialists like me at JGA Recruitment. Now, we exist and we know firsthand how much investment and time goes into locating a really fantastic payroll candidate. However, in your analogy, you talk about a slightly different problem. Mm. And the problem in your article is associated with how much we measure what top talent looks 
looks like. And I found your article quite refreshing and insightful. So I wondered if you could share with yeah. the listeners a little sure. bit more about sure. your mindset behind that article. So I'd been working with um, an entrepreneur, a very successful entrepreneur, and it was a medium sized business, but you know, very high revenues. He had a recruitment strategy, which was bring them in, meet with them twice, look for their CV, hire them or not. That was his recruitment strategy. What was funny about working with this gentleman was that he's a very empowered man, very successful, got a great relationship at home, things work in the office. We had to dig about a little bit to figure what was the thing that was not working for him. And and this was a little nugget that we pulled up. So I said to him, look, just you know, tell me what your recruitment process is. And he just told me what I've just told you. And it just became really clear to me that his recruitment process was, it wasn't founded in performance, right? So as a performance coach, it was easy for me to see. So here was the analogy I gave him. I said, look, imagine that you're a tennis coach and you're building a team and somebody walks in and they say, hey, I want to be on your team. And he says, all right, are you good at serving? I'm so good at serving. (laughs) Okay. And what about your backhand? I tell you what, I have been working on my backhand and it's just straight down the line. I'm really accurate with backhand. What about your fitness? You know, I can run about for at least four hours and not get tired. Okay. You're hired, right? You're in the team. And imagine you built your team like that. And then I asked him to imagine somebody across the, the town also building a tennis team and his strategy was slightly different. He would have somebody come in. Hey, I really want to be on your tennis team. Okay. How's your backhand? Oh, my backhand is fantastic. Okay, show me. Okay, and then he would start doing some backhand drills. Okay, how is your serve? Oh my God, don't worry, just show me. So essentially he would have this guy on the court and he would test people on the court and he would see for himself their level of performance. And then he would put people in his team based on how he evaluated their performance and he built the team. And then I said to him, imagine your tennis team played his tennis team, who would win? And in that moment, He just got the ineffectiveness of his recruitment approach. Sure. He got what he needed to do instantly. Sure, it's a really good answer. So last question. In your view, what is performance for us human beings? Okay. Performance is the action that you're taking or not and the way that you're being about it. Let's imagine, you know, like those, what do you call those people? They do do gymnastics, but with a ribbon, right? I mean, this, this is an idea that's coming to me now. So let's see if it really plays out. You know, they've got the actions that they're taking. They're, you know, they're jumping and cartwheels and backflips. But imagine they were being really moody. Okay. Imagine they were being sad or angry. Do you think they would be winning the gold? Imagine they were doing the most perfect backflips, but what's emanating from their way of being, it's maybe just not very inspiring. It's maybe negative. I mean, would it be even possible for them to perfect the backflip being that way anyway? Sure. So, you know, this is all performance, by the way, but I'm just pointing to the quality of one's performance. But performance is the actions that you're taking or not and the way that you're being. And if you want quality performance, you want to be taking effective actions, being clear about the actions that are non-effective and being ways that inspire you, being ways that empower you, being ways that inspire the people around you as well. That's, that's what I would say is quality performance. I think that's a really, really good way to, to finish the questions, which is fantastic. So we're going to open the vault. Entering the vault. So to finish the podcast... One piece of advice you would give to someone working in payroll right now? Celebrate your complaints. Can I just expand on the last thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I say celebrate their complaints, I mean, look, function of your role is to deal with people's stresses over errors. And I would celebrate when you have a complaint that comes in, celebrate that you were able to handle it. That's what I mean. You know, really celebrate that you you were able to contribute to somebody in that way rather than be like, oh my God, here's another complaint. And have that be a, a draining of your energy. Turn it into but, positive. Yeah, like, great. Do you know what? Awesome. I've got the chance to really help somebody out here. Celebrate that because dealing with those complaints in a great way is a real fundamental part of your role and it should be celebrated. Excellent. Excellent response. So with the benefit of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? It's a great question and I don't want to spoil the answer but by poo-pooing it, if you like, but I wouldn't change anything. My journey of, you know, what I've shared with you, the failures, the, you know, everything that I had to go through is what's led me to being where I am today. I wouldn't be able to coach people the way that I am. I wouldn't have had the experiences that I've had or the results in my own life if I hadn't had that that journey. I wouldn't change a single thing. Fantastic. Great. Excellent. If you had the power of foresight and could change the 9 to 5, 30 p.m. office-based industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? I would say um, more flexible working hours. In the modern age, we need more space. We need more freedom. And, you know, Google are leaders at this, right? They, you know, they've got people who work there on their 
terms, but the priority is that they get the job done sure. and they're trusted to get the job done. And that means mums can have their babies and still make work work for them. So it's really empowering staff that they are trusted, they are responsible adults, they can get the job done. And rather than this nine to five clocking in thing, I would get rid of that if you want to keep your staff. And we're seeing huge rises in flexible working yeah. arrangements coming through, which is which is interesting. Who motivates you and why? Do you know one of my favourite people that motivates me is Einstein. I love Einstein's curiosity. Sure. Um, and um, I don't do a lot of sharing quotes in my online social media. I share my own quotes and insights. But there is one person that I tend to share quotes and it's his. He had so much space to figure stuff out. He was, he gave himself so much space to come at everything completely newly. He came at everything. He didn't accept anything that anybody sure. told him. And that was what allowed him to create the theories and the quantum leaps in science that we have today because his ability to have space and to figure things out brand new, no matter what anybody else thought about it, no matter what anybody else said about it. One of my favourite quotes from Einstein is, it's something like, I think 99 times and come up with nothing. I swim in silence and the answer is revealed. Excellent. Well, I am a huge fan of that answer. And if you check out our website, it's very Einstein orientated. Oh, cool. He's the main image behind our brand. <laughs> All right. But he, well, he says that insanity is doing the same thing over and yes. over again and expecting yeah. a different result. Yeah. And I try and educate our clients to say, look, you may think you know what a recruitment process looks like because you've done it 99 times before, but if recruitment's evolved, yeah. like, try something different, try a new approach, try the way that we do things because it's it's not like the way we did things 10 years ago. Yeah. It's moved on. But he has so many quotes yeah. and he, you know, you were talking about him finding space. He did it in such a difficult political and economic time mm. as well. Absolutely. So I love that answer. Cool. And if you haven't checked it, go and check our website. You'll see lots more Einstein quotes. You can find them from there. And there'll be one on mine as well. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> if you didn't work in coaching, what would you be doing? If I didn't work in coaching, it would have maybe have been, I'm close to saying psychology, but it may have been acting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fantastic. Well, that just about wraps us up. So thank you ever so much, Ryan Matthew, for joining us today for the Payroll Podcast. I went to Ryan's website, it's ryanmatthew.com, and I found a poem that he's written. It's called Two Artists, and I'm going to ask Ryan to read it out just to finish the pod. So <laughs> cool. over to you, Ryan. All right. Thank you. I was not expecting this. Lovely. A little bit of context. I would never have thought I was the kind of person that could write poetry that you know, maybe spoke to something or that was worth reading or sharing. And at 4am one morning, this poem popped into my head and I wrote it between 4am and 4.30 one morning. It just really speaks to me about what happens when I coach. So it's called Two Artists. Two Artists Talking. I inspired, impassioned and energised through the power of a commitment, clearing away the old, making space for someone new. Vibrant colours of distinct applications call forth secret dreams and breathtaking views. A process of creation and a new vision declared. A choice that must be nurtured and chosen moment by moment over and over again. Freedom, awareness, joy, love, inner space. A life fulfilled is my body of work. Two artists just sitting and talking. The other artist is you. Brilliant way to finish the podcast. Thank you ever so much, Ryan. If you want to find out more about Ryan Matthew, please go to ryanmatthew.com. This is Nick Day from the Pearl Podcast. See you again next week. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.